Trevor, was that a question? No. No? No. Okay. What we've been uh, uh, working on so far, well, we're working towards our ability to uh, uh, not ascertain, to ensure static equilibrium. If we don't have this condition, then uh, we have acceleration and we don't have good structural analysis that requires that these structures do not accelerate. So we're working towards this, uh, this goal so that uh, nothing that we work on in this class accelerates. Uh, some of the stuff not only can't accelerate, can't even move. Uh, we don't want bridges to accelerate nor do we want them to move, other than if we're talking about a drawbridge or something, but that's a, that's a separate case. We're talking about just general bridges, like the, that brand new bridge they put across Lake Champlain up at Crown Point. Uh, that's a pretty bridge. That's a very nice bridge. So uh, we, don't, we, we want it to be there. When we get there, while we're on it, we'd like it to stay there. And so that's what we're, we're ascertaining with this. So we were looking the last couple days at uh, how to do this sum of the forces. And uh, you can do it graphically if you want. It doesn't hurt to make a sketch so that when you do it analytically, which is the better way to do it, you can see if it makes sense. If you make a sketch and it says the vector, the resultant of those vectors, the sum of those forces should go off in this direction at about that angle, and then you do the trig analysis and you get something that's about the same, you can relax and say, yeah, I think I did it right. But if they're in completely different directions, if, if the sketch says it goes like that, and the sum of the, and it's trig analysis says it goes off somewhere else, then you might want to worry you did something on one or the other. So you go back and you redo them until you find your mistake. So we were working on that. We're gonna have another part of this that we need. And it was introduced in Physics 1, and it's, it's no great shakes. You know from your life experience if we've got a, a, like a diving board or a gangplank or something, if you worked on a pirate ship over the summer, you saw some people go on the gangplank, you know that there's a very different relationship between all the things that are going on if we have a force there or a force there or anywhere in between. You know those are very different things in terms of what's going to go on. To, uh, to make sure that this thing doesn't accelerate, obviously we need a force that's going up and that would be supplied by the wall. The wall would keep, would, would exert a force up as the board exerted a force down. That's uh, Newton's third law, equal and opposite reactions. So that's no great trouble. But you also know from your very own experience that when you put a force out at the end of a, a board or a tree branch or something, things start to tend to turn. That board wants to start to go like this. You know that from climbing out on the tree or climbing out on the diving board at the swimming pool. As you walk out, that board bends down farther and farther and farther. If you just stay in at the middle, it doesn't bend down very much. If you go out at the bottom, back there, it bends down a lot. So there must be something that not only keeps this whole business from falling down because of this force, but also doesn't let it turn. It would be terrible to get on a diving board at the pool if the board turned right there. Next term, when we look at the strength of materials themselves, we'll look at why things bend like this and how to get the right bend that we want. How to keep these things so they bend enough, but not too little, and they don't break when they bend. In this class, our statics class this fall, None of our stuff bends. And unless I say otherwise, none of our stuff even has any mass. 
So this is a massless, bendless diving board. But what we're worried about is what's going on back here at the wall. Because that's what's going to keep this thing in static equilibrium. If this board wasn't attached to that wall, it's not going to stay where it is. And that's the requirement of this class. Things stay where they are. So we got this non-bending, massless diving board. And as you go farther and farther out, there's a greater tendency for that board to snap off at the wall. And you know that. You go out at the end of a tree limb, it's much more likely to break than if you stayed in kind of near the tree. So there's not just this business of how big the forces are, but where they are, we also have to look at. And we introduced this last term as torque. But that's not the term we use in this class. In this class, we'll use the term moment. They're interchangeable. If you use the word torque, I'm not going to be angry. But, uh, and I, sometimes I'll slip and say torque instead of moment because I'm also teaching physics at the same time. So too much stuff gets in my brain at times. And uh, I can't flush it out. Uh, but the book and every statics book I've ever seen refers to this business as moment. Um, remember the symbol we used in, in uh, physics 1 for torque? Yeah, we used just tau, a little, uh, a little uh, the, the lowercase Greek T. Uh, but in this class, we'll use M for moment. Sometimes we do some things that make sense. Not always, but this time we did. And do you remember how to calculate the torque exerted by a force? Remember, torque uh, or moment is, is a tendency of a force to cause something to turn. And what we're going to have to do is make sure it doesn't turn. So just like we had to oppose every force there was, we're going to have to oppose every moment there is. Since it's the tendency of something to turn, we need to understand turn about what point. Now, everything in this class doesn't turn about any point. But we need to specify which point when we make our calculation of torque and moment. There shouldn't be any, any net torque, any net tendency of the forces to make things turn anywhere. But it helps if we specify where when we, not only does it help, it's required that we specify where when we actually make this calculation. So it might make sense that we say we do not want this board to turn around the attachment point. Because if it turns around there, it's because the thing broke and whoever's on it falls off. So uh, we, can, we can even label that point A or point whatever you want. We'll label it point A. So in this class, I want you to put that down because we're going to pick several points in this class. We didn't, I don't think, in Physics 1, but we will in this class because you're smarter now, so I can do harder stuff. So we may need to pick other points in the very same problem, but we don't want them to turn around that point either. I don't want this board to turn around this point, but I don't want it to turn around that point either. So I can pick either one. I can pick anything else in between. I don't want it to turn anywhere. So we're going to have to balance all the moments just like we balanced all the forces. Should make a, a, a big surprise that how much this force causes this thing to turn about any point, in this case point A, is going to depend upon the size of that force. A little force isn't going to do very much. But a big force, you put my mother-in-law out there. Sorry, Nan, I'm just kidding got mad at me this summer when I told her she's in almost all my classes. Uh, it depends on how big that force is. A little feather out on the board is not going to do anything. But an elephant out on that board, a feathered elephant out on that board, 
that would do some amazing things. So surely the, the size of the force itself is in there. And what else is? Yeah, well, where that thing stands. If the if the elephant goes out there, or if it goes out there, it's going to be different than what's going on back here. And you you've experienced some of that if you've ever tried to hold hold something, hold a tray. You know, if you worked as a waitress or a waiter or something, and you're trying to hold a tray, so you don't. Well, you're probably not thinking, I don't want these things to accelerate. You're probably thinking, I don't want to spill anything. Because when you do, then they do that stupid thing where they applaud. They don't get up and help or make sure you're all right. They applaud. But you know that you're going to do a little bit better if the drinks are there than if you put them right out on the very end. Because it's just going to make that thing a little bit harder to hang on to. So you... You center the things back to safely. And you might even move your hands up to the center of the tray. What you're doing is changing the position of the force relative to where it's uh, going to do its most obvious turning. So the position of the force is also important. So we'll, we'll call that D. And it's the distance from point A, the point we chose, at which that force acts. Now, that's what we did in Physics 1, right? Yeah? Don't make me go track down your Physics 1 teacher and yell at him. Seems incompetent as it is. I can man, deal with that guy. Uh, however, this D only counts if what? There's a condition. It's already up here on the board, and I want to see if you remember what it is. There's a condition between this F and this D that must be there, a relation between the two that must be there for this to be the calculation of the moment or the torque. Remember what it is? No, because if there's more forces, if we have two people on the board, we'll just calculate a moment for each one of them and add them up. Just like we added up the forces, we'll just add up the moments. And we, we did a little bit of that in physics one. But for this to be the simplest way to calculate the moment, what must be true between a uh, relationship between the force and the distance measured, and it happens to already exist in this picture. Remember what it is? Perpendicular. Yeah, they have to be perpendicular. If the distance from the point to the line of action of the force, and by that I mean, I don't care if I've got, let me just do one for simplicity's sake. There's no difference to us between somebody standing on that board and somebody hanging from that board. There's no difference between those two. <clears throat> so the distance from the point of interest, we happen to pick A, but we can pick up, we can and will pick other points. Uh, distance between point A, shortest distance to the line of action of that force. The shortest distance between those points, well that is the perpendicular. Any other distance from A to the line of action is going to be longer. That's the smallest one, the perpendicular. And that's what we did in physics one. And so if we have the force out farther, put this one back now, and I don't have to put or, I can put and, because we could have two things on there, and they both are trying to bend this thing around to make the thing snap off at the wall. And both of them both of them have a minimum distance between the point of interest 
and the line of action on the force and uh, just keeping things simple still it's just twice as far out there we'll say then the force exerted by the second one uh, sorry the moment exerted by the second one twice as far away, it's going to have twice as great a distance away, per minimum perpendicular distance to the line of action of the force. Uh, this line of the action of the force is very important to us. Force is to us a sliding vector. We can move it anywhere along its line of action and we haven't changed its magnitude, its units, or its direction. Nor have we changed how it's going to act in the problem. Now, it might be certain problems make no sense if we do this kind of thing. You know, if we're looking at the roof beam, we're worried about things setting on the roof, not things hanging from the roof, really. But in terms of the calculation, there's no difference because we can slide a force vector anywhere along its line of action to help us do the calculation. That's going to be very useful to us in a day or two. So keep that in mind. Force is a sliding vector. If it can slide along its length, can't go sideways. Because if I moved F1 sideways, it, it changes this a lot. Because D is changing. But remember what D is called? It's called the moment. I can't remember if we use that term in, uh, in uh, physics one or not. It's the minimum perpendicular distance, the moment arm, the minimum perpendicular distance between the point of interest and the line of action of the force. Uh, one other thing that's true, you should remember from, from uh, Physics 1, is that there's a direction to this too. If we have these two situations, these are very different situations in terms of what's going to happen. In this upper case, we want to make sure that the wall, and that's what this hatch thing is, that means immovable, gigantic object that's doing whatever it is we need it to do, uh, that's going to keep the thing, the, the, uh, the tendency of that force is to make the thing go that way. That's the direction of its moment. The other one is going to tend to make things go this way. Even if they're the same force and the same distance away from our point of interest, point A, they're going to cause very different actions. And we then, as structural designers, this is kind of what we're doing in this course, need to oppose those, that, that tendency tendency of this board is to go down, we need to make sure the wall counters that by giving it a tendency to go back up. Uh, we do that by just embedding that board in the wall. And then the wall, uh, as it feels the board pushing down on it, it pushes back and counterbalances both the force and the moment that it's seeing. And this one, uh, this might take a completely different design for it to work than we would use up there. We might, may or may not be able to use exactly the same design for the two. So that's our introduction to moment. However, there's other things we need to consider.
Same, same diving board, just a very nice simple thing to be able to draw. Same diving board, same force on the two. Some certain magnitude, some units that go with that. However, maybe this one's like that. Same size, but different direction. So they're not the same force. They're different forces. They don't have the same units, magnitude, and direction. Same magnitude and units, not the same direction. Will this have the same calculated moment about our point A, if that's the one we choose, but we could choose any point. Is that one going to, is, is the bottom one have the same moment exerted about point A? Not only is it going to cause a different moment, it's going to cause different forces. This one, we have a force down, so we know the wall needs to exert a force up to balance it. This one, there's some of the forces down, and we need to balance that, but some of the force is out. So we're going to need to balance that at the wall with some force in. We're going to have to have a different attachment. If, uh, if we did this by just inserting it into a hole in the wall, and then we hit it with that force, it might pop out. So we're going to have, we have more things to deal with uh, once we get some angles here. But that's the reality of it, and you're smarter than we're in physics one, so we can handle all that stuff. But not only that, the, the moment here is different. How would we figure out what that is? Let's see. Let's let's uh, just for reference sake, we'll call that theta. That's the kind of thing we need to know in a design here. Um, let's see. We need uh, we need we need the distance between the point A, the smallest distance between the point A. And what? Is D just simply from here to where the force is applied? Is it from here to the tail of the force? Is it to the nose of the force? What is it? What do we use for D? I told you a couple seconds ago the line. The, 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 that's not the whole term. Yeah, the, so. the line, what line? Line of action. Of the force. The line of action, we need the minimum distance between that point and the line of action of the force. So here's the line of the action of the force. The minimum distance to that isn't along here. It's up here somewhere. Isn't that the smallest possible distance between the point A and the line of action of the force? Let's see. Um, if that's theta, then this angle is theta as well. And if, remember, the length of the board is D. We haven't changed that. We haven't changed the size of F. We just want to find out what the uh, what the magnitude of the force is here. So it's the force times this minimum distance. Force times this minimum distance. What is this distance? D. Cosine theta. So this would be D cosine theta. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And 
and you can, you can come up with that with a little sketch. If you know what that is, and you know what D is, you can do this. Um, what about this? Same length for D. Same force. Same angle. Yeah, just just a re-sketch there. But now I do this. What if I do this? I take this force and I break it into its components. A horizontal, a vertical component and a horizontal component. So I don't need that force anymore. I don't want all three forces on either the one diagonal one or the two perpendicular ones. I don't want all three. So I cross one of them out now that I've replaced it. Again, this is part of why you need to make a big enough drawing. Where there's a lot of stuff going in these. We're going to have a lot of forces, a lot of angles, a lot of components. So don't be shy. Look how big my paper is. You should be working on sheets of butcher paper rolled across the floor and you're, you're on it like you were as a little kid. You know, you're lying on your stomach and your feet are up and you got a little soda there with a little loopy straw. And you you got all your crayons spread out here and you're taking notes in college. That's what it should be. Well, then there'll be nap time later after we get some, uh, some orange juice and some graham crackers. Anyway, uh, how big is this component. If it was originally F, and we have it at some angle theta, this is F. That's F cosine theta, and the other one is F sine theta. You need to be real good at finding these trig uh, components um, as we go through this. So let's see what the moment is now due, not to our one original force, but to the equivalent two-force system. Because there's no difference in these two, is there? That system is the same as this system. So let's see what the moment is. Remember, we're doing it about point A. So this is the moment about point A. Well, we have two forces. So we need to calculate the moment of both of them because they both are contributing to this. So we've got this force, which is of magnitude F cosine theta. What's its moment arm? D, right, because it's, it's a distance D away, and that is the perpendicular minimum distance to that component. Its line of action is the vertical direction. So that's then times D. Now we've got the other force causing some moment, and they just add together. Just like the forces add together when we got a couple of them, the moments add together when we got a couple of them. F sine theta is the other component. What's its moment arm? The minimum perpendicular distance between point A and the line of action of that force. We're talking about this little horizontal component now. Zero. Zero. Let's see. Its line of action goes right back through point A. So the minimum per per perpendicular distance to A is zero. So I'll, I'll put that in. Zero. Or the moment about point A, due to the two perpendicular components of F, rather than the original diagonal F, is F D cosine theta. F D cosine. Same thing. You can do it either way. Whichever one you're more comfortable with. If you're comfortable finding this perpendicular distance to the line of action of the force, not to the force itself, but to the line of action of the force, which notice in my drawing was off the force itself and wasn't, didn't even touch it. But don't forget, this isn't a geometric drawing because force has magnitude in newtons, 
not meters, but we do need the geometry for the angles. Uh, or if you'd rather break it into components like that, you get the same thing. So I don't care what you do. Some problems will be easier to do this way. Some problems will be easier to do this way. Whichever one works for you, I don't care. Except, when we go to three dimensions, this is, neither one's very easy. Because it's so hard to do a decent drawing in three dimensions so that you can get these Ds or these components and know which one goes back through which hole and all that. This is very difficult. We need something that's more powerful so that we can do it in three dimensions. We've got that. We've got just such a tool. Remember, this is a two-dimensional problem here. So the moment can only be clockwise or counterclockwise. So we usually handle that with either uh, uh, just writing down clockwise or counterclockwise. Or we also might do it as counterclockwise we happen to call positive clockwise, we happen to call negative moments. They had negative values. Uh, I'll remind you where that comes from in a second when I get the full three-dimensional version up here. And that's because moment itself is a vector. I didn't need to put it as a vector here because it, we were just going to go plus or minus which way it went. And that's, for the most part, all we did there. But we need some more powerful way to do this. And, uh, and here it is. I'm not going to show you how it's developed. I'm not even sure how it was developed, what the history of it is. But we don't need the history. We need to be able to do it. It's like when you drive your car, you don't need the history of the car or cars in general. You just need to make sure yours works. You know, it's history. So, uh, we're going to have this position vector R. This is going to do what D did for us. Only well, it's going to be more universal because now we can do it in three dimensions. Uh, it'll work in two, uh, but it just will definitely need it for three. Uh, this is a position vector. It locates something. It locates where the point A is in relation to the force which is exactly what we've got here. We need to know how far apart these things are. So, uh, we'll, we'll call it RA. We've got to be careful, as you'll see in a second, just what I mean, uh, just what that position vector is. If you get it wrong, you're doing a different problem. As with any vector problem, if you're working with the wrong vector in the problem, you're doing the problem wrong. So we've got to be very careful with that and how we define it. We do the cross product of that vector. And I'll remind you how to do cross products here in a second because it's so very important to what we're doing. Cross with the, oh, I don't need an A on there because it could be any force. Cross with the force vector. The cross product is a mathematical operation between two vectors that results in a vector. This will give us a value that has magnitude and, of course, units when we put numbers in, and direction. We had a hint of direction here. What this means now is not moment will not be just clockwise or counterclockwise in the plane of our paper because we're going to three dimensions, moment can point anywhere. Depending on what the forces are and where those forces act, an object can tend to turn around a point in any direction in three-dimensional space. And that's going to give us the full picture here. All right, so what I'll do, let's see, let's, let's do this the first time.
we can do it with uh, the very same picture we have here just to see if it gives us the very same answer we just had. So we'll take the simplest possible situation we've got and test drive this. So there's our point A. Now the vector F, let's see. Uh, it's a vector. We're going to need it as a vector. So we'll do that one first, and then we'll do RA in a second because it's a, a little bit harder. This is easy. It's the magnitude times the direction, which in this case is, well, if we use usual things, which we will, is minus J. Right? That vector is in the downward vertical direction, which we usually call minus j. So let's stick with that just so we make fewer mistakes. So there's, there's the vector f. So cross with minus f j. Now, here's the vector Ra, and uh, it's going to turn out to be very, very useful for us. Even two-dimensional problems can be easier this way sometimes. Uh, th certainly three-dimensional problems will be a lot easier this way. In fact, I don't know how to do the three-dimensional problems we have coming up if Ra wasn't this easy to apply. Ra is the position vector that relates the point A to the force F. And it works like this. It starts at point A, and it goes to the force F. Where on the force F? Anywhere along the line of action of the force F. Anywhere. But I'll take the simple one on this first try, and we'll call that the vector RA. which is uh, how far away are those two? D. Yeah, I called it D. So this is of magnitude D in the I direction. To the right, plus I. So, so there's, our, there's our vector A in this case. It's D, I. All right. Okay. That's the setup. Now let's remind ourselves how to do the cross product so we can do the cross product. So here's the cross product. We're doing a cross product on moments, and it's some position vector crossed with some force vector. So this is just generic now. I'm not going to put on the A's in here uh, because I want it to apply to any situation we've got. Here's how you do the cross product. You, you may there if you do a, if you do a Google search on cross product, and uh, there's lots of different ways people have to remember these. None of them work with my little brain, so you're welcome to those things. They just don't work for me, so I'm not going to try to put them up because I tried to I tried to I tried to write them out last night. There's my efforts. I said, hell with that, I'll do it the way I know how to do it. They're welcome to come up with something else. It doesn't matter, because it's got to be the same. So here's how to do it. Here's how I remember to do it. It's a 3x3 three three matrix. And this is all set up. This is no calculation yet. It's a 3x3 three three matrix. Across the top of the matrix are the unit vectors i, j, and k. And the, any cross product works this way, but we need this cross product, so we'll do it. Uh, the middle row is the three components of the position vector, which is R, X, R, Y, R, Z. And that's usually in a three-dimensional period of problem, not that hard to come up with. You've got some point of interest, A, and you force some force acting somewhere out in 3D space, and you know where that is. So we can, we'll pick that right off of the graphs. 
And then the third and last line of this three by three matrix is the three components of F. Fx, Fy, and Fz. It is not pronounced fuzz. It's Fz. All right, that's just set up. That's just, you know, the, the cross product is just a recipe. So what we've done is made sure that we got all the stuff out of the cabinet and out of the refrigerator that we're going to need, and we set them up kind of in the order we're going to use them. Now, now we've got to start combining ingredients and stirring. So here's how it goes. And this is the same for any cross product. So if you've got an A cross B or, or whatever you can come up with. You, who, you, are you guys in physics 3 yet? Okay, that's next term? Okay, you're going to be doing lots of cross products with current and uh, magnetic fields and forces exerted therein. Uh, so you're going to you're going to need this, and it works for any cross product you need. It's just a recipe. We're making an R and F because that's what we got going here. All right, first thing we want to figure out the I component of this vector. So I put down the I component. And that's what I'm starting with. Usually we put that afterwards, but if I put it before, no big deal. Uh, F minus F J is the same as J minus F. It's just a, it's just an order of things. Um, it's just that's where I start, so that's why I put it out there in front. Now, look at where I itself is, and imagine that we throw out the row where I is. Sorry, throw out the column where I is and the row where I is. That leaves us with just those four things. And we do the cross multiplication of those. R, Y, F, Z. R, Y, F, Z. Minus the other diagonal. Minus R, Z, F, Y. That's the I component of the moment vector. Whatever those happen to be, you just pull them right off of the picture or right out of the problem or wherever you get them. That's the I component of the uh, moment vector. Now, minus, and again, this is just how I happen to remember this thing because my brain's not very big. Now we're, we'll do the other component. So it's minus the J component. Look where the J is, right here in the middle of the top. Imagine ignoring its row and column. So again, we ignore the top row. We ignore the middle column. We've got just these two four things, these four things here. That was higher mathematics right there. Uh, we've got just these four things. And we do the very same cross product we just did. Remember on this first one, we went uh, diagonally down, then diagonally up. We do that again, diagonally down, RxFz minus, we always have a minus between these two diagonals we're doing. We did diagonally down, now we do minus diagonally up, RzFx. There's the J component. Same, same diagonal, same cross multiplication we did on the four for I, we do on the four for uh, J in the same direction. You gotta have this minus sign. Because otherwise this will screw up. And you want that to you want what do these the same way? Everything. That's what I think. Plus k hat. You do the same thing. Ignore the row and column for k. Top row, bottom, uh, back uh, column. There. We've got just these four. We do diagonally down, minus diagonally up. R x f y minus because we all do a minus between the two diagonal directions. Rx Fy minus Ryfx. And 
there's the K component. As a check, make sure in the X direction, no X values play. In the Y direction, no Y values play. In the Z direction, no Z values play. Be careful with this, because if you get any one of those wrong, if any one of these numbers is wrong, if any one of those minus signs is wrong, you're doing a different problem. Don't come to me for help. Well, I don't know where you're supposed to go for help if it's not me. Uh, that's the recipe. And then if, when you rewrite it, if you want to put the I after following like we usually do, that's fine. That's fine. The I, J, and K just didn't know no, there's going to be no numbers associated with that. No, That's those are direction. unit vectors. Those are exactly like they are there. Those tell us the direction of the x component. Okay. Well, the x component's in the x direction. But this is a vector, so we need that. We yes. can't have a vector equal to things that aren't vectors. Who, who was wise enough to tell you that? Okay, so let's, let's try it on this very simple one that we've already done and see what we get. So we'll set up the, we've already done, we know the answer is going to be F times D. We already know that. But let's just double check that the cross product works because it doesn't, you should get your money back. All right. What goes across the middle of this three by three matrix? The position vector, which is here, it's di. So it's got a d component in the i direction. What's its component in the j and k direction? Zero. Zero. So those are two zeros. Then the bottom row is the force vector, which is in the j direction only, and it's minus f. So this is zero minus f, zero. Okay, in the I direction, and I'm just going to stack these up just because I'm running out of space there. In the I direction, get rid of that column and that row. I've got just these four. I have zero times zero minus something times zero is zero. Roger? Uh, follow the recipe. Minus J. All right. It's going to be so short, I don't need to put it up like that. Minus the J component. And make sure your J's and your I's look different. Students tend to make I's and J's look very similar. Drive me nuts. Uh, okay, J. Uh, get rid of the J row, get rid of the J column. We have just these two. D times zero minus zero is nothing. plus the K direction. Now, let's see, is the smart money betting this will be zero too and our whole world goes away? Let's see. Get rid of that K row and the K column, we have just these two things. So it's, it's uh, D times minus F, minus F, D, just changing the order a little bit because uh, it's multiplication, minus zero, zero. So this is minus FD. So the magnitude's right. That's what we had before. And now we have a full direction on it. Minus K. Is that right? Well, let's see. This would tend to turn things this way in a clockwise direction. And that's our minus direction in two dimensions. On the, on the board or on the paper. We said clockwise is minus. Okay, I think we're, are we done or we have another minute or two? We got another minute or two. Because that's just two dimensions. We could have done that. That was the hard way to do a very simple problem. But it allowed us to double check. How did the end of K? I mean, wouldn't K be the direction coming out of the board? Yeah. Yeah, remember, 
Remember we told you when we did uh, rotational motion that, that rotation is a vector as well. And we did it with the right hand rule. Put your fingers in the direction of curl that forces your thumb in into the board is negative. So that's minus K. And it's perpendicular to the other two forces. That's another characteristic of the cross product. These three vectors are mutually perpendicular. That's in the I direction, that's in the J direction, this is in the K direction. They're perpendicular. That's always the case. In three-dimensional space, that's very difficult to ascertain. So we're going to have to do this carefully and trust what we got. Uh, but that's the right-hand rule. The direction it tends to turn is our minus direction. And that works for uh, any of these cross products. Put your fingers in the direction of the first force, which in this case is that way. Cross your fingers into the direction of the second force. Well, that's the wrong way. I've got to flip my hand over to cross it into the direction of the second force. So it's R cross F. That orients my thumb into the board again. I can't get my thumb any other way if I go in the direction of R, the direction of F. Another way, if you want to do it, you can set up your fingers. I had to make a gun noise like that so Fiona would recognize it because girls can't make gun noises. They, they used that. It was the test they used at the Olympics for who's woman and who's not. Okay, make a gun noise. You're in the woman's event. That's what they do. Um, so, uh, first vector with your first finger, second vector with your second finger. So let's see. First vector, second finger, second vector. It's got to go down because that's the force vector. So R, F. That puts my thumb into the board. There's no other way to do it. So. I can't let anybody take this course if they don't have a right hand. It's never come up, but that's, I don't know what else to do. I, God forbid when it happens. Okay, now we're done. We'll do some more of these. We'll do some three-dimensional problems then uh, coming up. This might be a good tattoo to get. Oh, stop the tape. I don't want to take any erasing the board.